Hello everyone, I'm Fang Rei. This is the Service Design Show, episode 202. Welcome back, service design enthusiasts, to the show where we invite the brightest minds in our field to explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push our businesses forward, and honor our planet. Let me ask you a question. Are you designing services on a shaky, broken foundation? You might be surprised. Imagine building a rocket to reach orbit while believing the Earth is flat. Now, good luck with that. Today, that idea is of course completely ridiculous. Yet, history is full of truth, later proven completely wrong. Now, the rocket example might be a bit silly, but our guest today argues that we might be designing solutions on beliefs that are equally flawed. Beliefs we don't question, but future generations might find absurd. Here's a fair warning. This episode might challenge your worldview. Please keep an open mind. See this as a chance to question the structures governing our world. Could you be overlooking other perspectives? Spoiler alert, yeah. And what opportunities and consequences arise from adopting a new world view? That's why our guest today, Feng Rei Zhang, will help us challenge deeply rooted beliefs and start to unlearn what we think we know, to redefine our relationships with fundamental concepts like nature and money, to see beyond the obvious and design for the invincible forces at play, and to move past surface level solutions and redesign the underlying systems themselves. In this episode, you'll hear a fascinating story where we explore what it would be like when a house would own itself rather than being a property owned by humans. Now, if this sounds strange, even a bit crazy, that's the whole point. Stories like this challenge us to see the world differently. They invite us to reflect on our existing beliefs. I encourage you not to dismiss these ideas too quickly. Let them sink in, marinate a bit before forming an opinion. If you've ever needed a fresh perspective, we've got you covered in this one. So join me for a thought-provoking conversation with Feng Ray, and I'll be back with some closing thoughts at the end of the conversation. My name is Mark Fontijn, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Feng Rei. Hey. Nice to have you on. Uh, <laughs> Thank our you for conversation me. was a long time in the making, so I'm really excited uh, to finally be able to have this conversation with you. Um, we always start with a short introduction of our guest. Uh, I've looked into your history. You have a very long and interesting history, but maybe you could give us an overview of what you're doing these days and maybe a short uh, reflection on how you got here. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the strategic designer and uh, responsible innovation lead at Dark Matter Labs. So Dark Matter Labs, we are an organization focused on building the um, institution infrastructure and necessary to make societal uh, centered on interdependence, uh, equality, and justice, and reality. So I lead the uh, portfolio and mission called Radical Civics. And a lot of the work we're doing within this mission is to um, firstly talk about the worldview shifts needed. And so it would involve like um, three shifts uh, from looking at the world like seeing everything as objects or commodities that we can extract from uh, towards seeing everything as agents, looking at um, not not excluding like externalities, but looking at the entanglement and really question the dichotomy of private and public and looking at how we can do commoning and looking at governance uh, in a new way for all being thriving. So 
I know th this sounds a bit abstract, so we can we'll dive get into, into the, the work yeah, later we'll get on. into yeah. juicy details. Uh, radical civic, right? That's what you uh, call the yeah. It's not a department, but how do you call it? Studio or how do you division? <laughs> how do you call this within Dark Matter Labs? Yeah, we have so many different terminologies we use, like like mission labs and studios. Um, so so we currently um, categorize that as as the mission, um, but we are always in conversation of how we better position certain types of work. So, mm. for example, in uh, in my organization, we also have natural based solutions, uh, mission, and uh, spatial justice. And radical civics um, is one of the missions. We also have labs and studios. Um, so, like uh, we have democracy lab. So those are more theme based, kind of like almost the kind of capabilities and the themes that are needed across different missions and different projects. Then we would have labs and we have studios. So focus on like. So for example, we have civic tech studios because some of the work might need support from like a more hands-on capability like civic tech. So then we have those uh, studios. So currently, Radical Civic is part of a mission. And then within mission, we have projects. So we can have like different projects that align with the mission. So that's how we currently categorize those I'm, different I'm sure kinds that there of... is a great visual to explain <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um, before we uh, dive deeper into all these topics, um, there is another question that we always ask, and that is how you got in touch with service design. Do you recall that moment? Yeah, so um, before I studied service design at the Royal College of Art uh, from 2014, I was working at a design company called Aqua Design and we in, in Taiwan. So I grew up and I studied in Taiwan um, before I studied service design in the, in the UK. When I was doing design, um, we uh, we do a lot of like work with the city government uh, around um, like strategies. We do a lot of um, participatory design, community engagement, um, like anything related to community building and city planning and um, re uh, uh, urban regeneration and and more and. There was a moment where I realized that when we were interacting with the government, one of the work was particularly around um, designing street furniture and with the city government and, and more specifically like the beings in the city and how we design it from the perspective that gives dignity of the street cleaners and also that echoes with um, the users, the citizens, um, habit and also how it fits within the city's brand. Um, during that time, in the procurement process, uh, we weren't able to do rapid prototyping. And it's because of the procurement law and the procurement process was designed that way. And that was a moment of realization that the actual design doesn't lie in, like not, not only is about how we make sure we improve the experience of street cleaners and the experience of um, citizens and the perspective of the government's uh, city branding, but also the underlying structure needed in order to allow this work to happen. So without being able to do prototyping, we can only do like the final design, which doesn't make sense <laughs> in the design process. Like we always have to prototype and improve things. So it makes me think what what is my career uh, shift and the things I need to learn in order to operate in the design space that allows me to look at uh, the holistic uh, perspective of the whole design process, uh, pre uh, design processes. And that's when I started to get into survey design to look at more holistic picture. But then after doing the survey design and I realized that there's a bigger picture about system design and more so yeah i'm always uh, learning and and looking at how we can do design in a way that works for people and the planet nice thanks thank you for sharing um we have a lightning round uh to get to know you as a person next to a professional even better uh the challenge for you here is to 
be very brief with answers. One, two, three words, maybe uh, the first thing that comes uh, to your mind. Um, are you ready? Like I have to answer the the questions really like in a really quick sense. Yes. Okay, I'll try okay. my best. <laughs> Let's give it a try. I, these aren't, no, we'll see if they are hard. But the first question I have for you is, which book do you always recommend that people read? Wow, there are so many of them. The first one that um, came up to my mind is the book uh, by David Graeber, The Dawn of Everything. Noted. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear is that uh, we live in a world where we are uh, trapped in the structure we created um, in the past, like the governance models, the property systems. It, it's like a trap that allows us to um, have the freedom to ex escape rather than the freedom to care. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid of those systems that trap hum humanity in the past and in a way that is uh, in an attractive relationship with the world. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, how do you wish to be remembered? I want to be remembered as a, as a being who have contributed to like just a small change of the society and the environment in mm -hmm. any way that would have a boss pot, like people will see that as a positive influence to the world. If you could uh, work from anywhere in the world, which place would you pick? I will pick Earth in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice, at least for now. Uh, and the fifth and final question is, uh, finish the sentence, and the sentence is, our world needs more... Imagination. Ooh. Radical imagination. Radical imagination. Cool. So thank you for that. Uh, you did a great job. Feng Rei, uh, when we were discussing the preparation for our conversation, one of the things you mentioned about your wish for us is that we are building a future where all beings thrive or are thriving. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so when when I use the term being, it doesn't mean like the living things, but also like the quote unquote things that people will seem as dead things, but they are not really dead things. So just want to be clarified, like being means like everything. Can you yeah, give an so example? Like a rock, people will think a rock is dead or soil, but they are not really dead. They are part of the, like, the the the, the greater ecosystem. They they change over time. Like if you look at the life cycle of soil and rocks, for example, like they are not just like static rocks. They were like if we look at volcano, they were like in the deep heart of the earth, and they burst out. And the, the agency they have is like how how you perceive how they react. Um, to the different combinations of the force and agency. Um, yeah, so I hope that's uh, a clear explanation of um, the beings. And we're, we're in constant relationship with everything. So we are not just ourselves. I think the biggest problem or the, the challenge we have as a worldview is that we see ourselves different from everything else or like we can see um, the divide between humans and the like the natural world but actually we're part of nature so that's also the context behind the beings like beings not just the being of things and either we call it dead or like living things but it's the entanglement of those things it's really the essence of um why i use the term beings is the relationship the ongoing interaction the ongoing care relationship uh, between beings so going back to your question about why we do the work around, like the goal is to towards building a world towards uh, uh, all beings thriving, is like currently we see um, the worldview we have and the, the, the way we perceive the world is through a lens of dead things. And a lot of design lies in this connotation or like lies in this kind of worldview of seeing like different things are separate. But 
at the core essence of the radical civics uh, portfolio and the mission is like we want to design in the space of uh, creating a society and an environment that allows us to be better humans, to be better in better relationship with everything else. And it can be done through finance uh, innovation, governance innovation, and, and more. And these are the two areas that uh, we're currently interacting with. So just to provide some urgency why it's needed, because um, like we can see there is um, climate crisis, there are wars happening. And um, and when I, earlier I mentioned like we were trapped in the old systems, just take example of property, like the, the origin of property is comes from like, I can put my stick on this land and claim this as mine. And that kind of mindset is what I call like the structure we created in the past that trap us because it makes us to look at things that are, uh, that has lines. Like within these lines, I'm the landowner. I have responsibility and I can do whatever I want with this boundary. Everything else, it is not my business. Same as the economy. Economy, we have the term called externalities. Like, like a water, water company dumps switch into the river, um, they save the cost so they can have more profit, but they don't look at the externality they create, which is the environmental degradation, de degradation and so on. And they call it externalities. So that's, that's a kind of context behind what we mean by all beings thriving. There are a lot of design space uh, in there we can do to ensure that we don't get trapped in the old um, structure, in the old worldview that we feel comfortable and familiar with. And, and there's an unlearning and relearning process needed to allow us to open up the new de design space, which is the dark matter, uh, we say, which is the underlying structure, it's the laws, the contracts, it's the policy, it's the things that's, that are invisible but we can design them so we can fundamentally change the structure and how we organize our future. So let me, uh, uh, and this uh, story begs for a lot of examples and uh, yeah, stories, I guess. But I'm, before we start looking into the future, the systems we've put in place, um, apparently they have or were serving a purpose otherwise they wouldn't have been in in place and adopted by society at such a large scale if you look back at history like what is your take on the fact that we are claiming property or that that what i'm trying to formulate the question here and the question is maybe what has changed or is changing that you feel the systems, the old systems, aren't adequate uh, anymore. So when did it fail? When did it start to fail? Yeah, but uh, again, apparently uh, they have worked and they have served a purpose. So what's, what's changing except for a climate crisis and war, wars, which there have always been, obviously, but... Yeah, I think there are a lot of things that are... If we look back history, there are a lot of things that worked and didn't work. And it, so it's like on, on, ongoing processes. Um, so I'm not saying like, oh, we are like, everything is wrong at this moment. Um, I'm just trying to provide a piece of example, like what didn't work in the past. And, but it did work somewhere else. So I can give you an example. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in Taiwan and um, the cultural in, in Asia and in Taiwan has really influenced a lot of uh, my design ethos. Um, from the past, even until now, I'm still learning um, the histories and the cultures. I'm also doing unlearning and relearning even for my own cultural and so one story I heard from my indigenous friend uh, in Pawanese nation in Taiwan. Um, 
So for and and it's a story from him and he his elder his elders. So when they want to build a house uh, in their local community, they will go to the river and and get permission from the river to borrow the stone to build their house. And that is a very visceral experience um, they have based on the worldview I was talking about. And that worked uh, in the past, in their culture. And property doesn't exist. The concept, the notion of property doesn't exist. Um, in that perspective because you're borrow because you're borrowing you're borrowing exactly you're borrowing. so it's not yours you're just lending it from nature for a different yeah. use yeah okay so it's not yours and they made a promise to the river if they they are moving away then they are going to return the the stone back to the river so the concept is like i am in care with the earth and I have certain responsibilities. I'm not saying everything is super wrong with property because the property has also a lot of connotations. It has, um, res you can attach responsibility from work towards that as well. You can say, oh, I'm the, the owner of the house. So therefore I have responsibility to take care of the house. You can put it in that way, but also property has a connotation to like extraction. So for example, if I'm the owner of the land, I can basically stop any water coming through me. And then like people, like there are uh, nations living upstream, that's that's what's happening. So you can you can be in a care caring relationship with, with you, the things you own, the property you have, but you can also have um, an extractive relationship with that. So I'm challenging the negative side of property and providing some um, seeds for imagination of and looking at how indigenous um, people and other uh, um, type of uh, other people who have different culture, different philosophy, look at how what we can learn from them and see how we can build a more uh, like reciprocal relationship uh, with everything, um, everything we're interacting with what is um i love these examples and i'm seeing this movement uh fortunately uh going on in our design space but i'm curious what are some or what is an example that a modern age example where you see this reciprocal relationship working really well i don't asking a river for permission uh, i don't I haven't seen that in a design process uh, or a design idea solution implemented, but maybe you have some modern day uh, equivalents that you can share with us. Yeah, so um, so in, um, in Dark Matter Labs, uh, earlier I mentioned we do quite a lot of uh, governance design. So I can give you an example of a contract design we have. So for example, if, I have a contract. We can design the contract with, say, a house, a land, or a river. But here I'm giving an example of the contract with a house. Um, so I can say I am in a caring relationship with the house I'm currently inhabiting in. And there is a timber beam. Uh, there are timber, timber structures in the house. I can sign the contract. One of the clause within the contract um, is that I hold the responsibility to store the carbon in the timber structure for 100 years. And therefore, I have the use right to inhabit, inhabit in this place. And this is just one clause, but in the contract, we have we can have many different clothes and we can see the design that has already happened in elsewhere as well. So for example, there are companies, they, you know, like they would try to, this is a, a, a mixture of good and bad example. Like there are companies who are trying to own materials because it will reduce um, the cost of them, like mining new materials. 
and they can reuse the, those materials. So they incentivize you to return the product back to them. They will then upcycle those materials and they are trying to own those materials in a way that they, they can be the stewards um, of the material flow. So we, for example, a house is a complex relationship systems. It has material flow, it has social flow, it has health flow, uh, it has many different like financial flow and so on. So we can have a clause about materiality. Like what kind of relationship do we want to have with the house and the material flows with the house? So the house, not just timber, right? There are also maybe bricks. Uh, so what kind of relationship do we want to have with the timber and also the timber before? Before timber, it, they were trees, and 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 after the timber, they may be become something else. They may go back to earth. So the contract design, we need to think about the space, like even before and after uh, the life of the timber, and looking at how we want to have the relationship with the trees, with with the timber, and what happened afterwards, and then so. How do we make sure we are in constant re, uh, relationship and we are responsible for the flows of the rec um, the, the the material? So I cannot just say, "Oh, I want more space. I want to like destroy this um, cement wall or this timber wall." Because if I do so, I no longer have the responsibility in caring relationship with the house and the environment. Therefore, I might not have the right to live here anymore so it, it puts us in a better position and a better relationship in in comparison to the old system which is i own the property i can do whatever i want with it towards i care for you so you care for me so how can we design the contract to allow that to happen with different stakeholders like different uh timber construction um uh company uh like the tree conservative of uh, the the people who grow trees the people who upcycle timber for example look at the whole uh supply chain this what you're uh giving as an example was already inherited in indigenous cultures and probably already still is in let's call it quote unquote the richer parts of our world this seems to have disappeared completely these relationships have been broken and the conce uh, concept of ownership is very strongly tied into our fabric of society i own this house it's mine i can do whatever i want and now we're sort of trying to advocate for moving back and restoring those relationships the question i have here is what need or desire have have we missed so apparently the indigenous culture sees something that we aren't seeing in in my culture and sort of the for lack of a better word the western culture what are we missing so this is just a personal reflection and a lot of the conversation we have today is also from my personal experience. So it's, it may not be the truth, but I'm just providing um, one. Same goes one for me. <laughs> I don't, one perspective. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think what is missing for me, from my perspective, is that um, we, we need stories to allow us to behave and interact with the world differently. And we need the muscle to be able to Im imagine how we can be in a more caring relationship with the world. I think we don't have much space currently in the society to allow us to exercise this kind of muscle for radical imagination. And the, the opportunity to, for, for, to even allow us to challenge the things that we we take for granted. Uh, so, what would you what would you or what are you challenging uh, that you maybe have taken for granted in the past? I think property is a very good example. Like, I can own the space, so I can do whatever I want. 
Um, and that is not the case anymore by uh, by personally going through a lot of unlearning and relearning processes to look at the world differently. Um, yeah, before, before I respond to your question, I also want to brought up another angle that really influenced the transition for me uh, is to look at quantum physics. So earlier we talked about uh, traditional indigenous knowledges and, and their wisdom. We can also look at it from the scientific uh, perspective, which actually like echo this kind of worldview as well. So um, one person, um, uh, David Bohm, uh, he's a, a science, scientist, uh, a theoretical physics, and he uh, contributed to a lot of like um, unorthodox ideas to quantum, quantum theory, neuropsychology and uh, the philosophy of mind. He's really, to me personally, he's one person that be able to, we see science and spirit, spirituality like something really different, but based on like his, um, his science and the, the way he describe and view things, it, like they are actually quite entangled. So I would recommend his um, documentary. It's called uh, "In uh, Infinite Potential: The Life and Ideas of David Bohm." And within that uh, documentary, um, a, a lot of people were familiar uh, familiar with and uh, Anthony, the artist uh, Anthony Gourmet. He mentioned quantum physics invite us to be participators in the emerging of a world that has very uh, uh, fundamental, philosophical, spiritual, and political implication, which are essentially that each of us is a co-producer of a world. So my takeaway is like, we are all co-producers co of possible futures. And Dalai Lama also mentioned, uh, uh, um, had a, uh, had a, uh, Dalai Lama was also like being mentioned in the, in the film and and Dalai Lama said that there are two levels of inter interdependency uh, the first one is about external things and the second one is about internal things so the external things could be um, nation like earlier you mentioned about um, the 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 existing structure that we can uh, rethink not 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 just not trying to like challenge um, or break it, but just to rethink about why they come to existence. Like, so the, extern the external things are nations, countries, um, environment, human beings, um, animals, everything, every beings are interdependent. Um, so according to that reality, we have to take care of the whole world and the environment. And the second, um, the second level is the internal. So we are internally related to everything, not externally related. So consciousness is an internal relationship to the whole. We taking the whole and we and we act towards the whole. And that internal whatever we have taken in, determine basically what we are. Um, and so I haven't even gotten to the, the, the perspective of quantum physics, which allow us to see things very differently. Like classic uh, physics allow us to look at the dynamic of things that are visible to us, but quantum physics deal with the movement between things that we cannot really see um, in the very like micro space. So for example, like an electron can exist in two places at the same time. And that is not something that, you know, like very long time ago, if we just study classic physics, that is the idea that we wouldn't really think about it. And in the past, like people were saying, oh, uh, Earth were circling, you know, like we, we are the center of the world. But then scientists later on said, we are not. The sun is uh, in the center um, of, um, and then Earth is like circling around around that. 
So sorry, there's a lot to unpack here, but what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of things that we like originally for, um, familiar with, or we take for granted with time and with new discovery and with new learnings, our worldviews always uh, can always shift. And those worldviews sometimes could be beneficial for us to reflect our current system, just like the examples I mentioned earlier, uh, beyond property. And, and those are the radical, the space for radical imagination mm -hmm. and the space for, for design into uh, intervening. Thank you. And uh, I love that it's uh, holistic, it's rich, it's complex, uh, and it gives food for thought. And the way, the one thing or a thing that I'm getting from this is maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, we'll look back at this time and think, hmm, they, they were thinking about property. That was silly. Just as we are thinking about the sun is uh, rotating around the earth, like we're laughing at this and in 30 years or 50 years or 100 years time, they will be laughing at us because we had this silly system of property. Like, is that is that a shift that you're describing? Yes. The question that arose while I was listening to this story is, how do we prevent overwhelm? So I'm looking at your video feed for the people who are listening to podcasts. I'm seeing books behind you, chairs, plants, uh, glass. When I consciously have to think about the relationship of all these things to me, to nature, treat them as a service or a process or a verb rather than a noun. Ooh, that's, that's a lot. How do you handle that? Yeah. The, how do I personally handle this is to, um, go allow it to go through my brain and my heart and my body. So I cannot, personally, I cannot design something that I don't have feeling with. So firstly, I have to embrace. I need to embrace this worldview that I'm, I'm unlearning and relearning to get to the stage at, that how I operate at the moment. Um, so it requires a lot of physical work, like I wouldn't be able to do this work if I don't, I don't farm. Uh, so I started a small scale farming, building my, like my actual muscle body memory to be able to understand how soil work and how plants and soil work in a space of uh, symbiosis. Like how a being, a, a being uh, would, the, the root of the being will fix nitrogen uh, in the soil and how how a bee is so important to pollinate my tomatoes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have tomatoes. Like it's a very exper um, the visual experience because th there, there was one time I, I, I left the tomatoes in the greenhouse and I didn't open the window. So the bees wouldn't be able to go in and I have no tomatoes. And I wouldn't be able to do the design in this entanglement space without actually experiencing that to see, okay, my survival is so dependent on the entanglement of how things need to work together. So my, the, the fact that I'm able to survive is dependent on the trees who are able to provide oxygen. So my life is totally dependent on them. So why can why it, it provides the, no incentive for me to destroy the planet in order to keep ourselves uh, living. So it's through that visceral experience to, uh, that allows me to see the entanglement. But I I hear totally hear you like the day to day we have to we have to almost, live our lives. I, yeah. I have to go through like a process of con continu continuously censoring myself because, and, and it was really painful and difficult. Like, 
What made I it what buy. made it difficult <laughs> and what made it painful? If you go to a supermarket, there are a lot of things are still in plastic package packaging, right? Mm -hmm. Like just talk about this in a really day to day life. Like my only choice are those things that are not. So, and then you your life life choices would like reduce a lot. I know a lot of supermarkets are doing great. Like they are trying to reduce their packagings. And I know this is very cliche to say, you know, like not buy those things. Um, but in reality, where you you want something like it, it's there and then that's the only option you have. Like, how do you do those micro decisions in your life? And it becomes really a lot. So I would say it's very difficult to, yeah, to live a life like that. But, but I also feel like it's almost like we're in the, I think we're just passing the threshold of 1.5 degrees C, right? The, the other day, like, and it's like a sense of emergency to me. And I know it's also not down to individual because a lot of work, like I know individual has responsibilities, but they are also like institutional responsibilities that that um, are the the key the key drivers of um, of this crisis. So, yeah, I think my the way I cope with is is to be able to recognize this reality, recognize we are living in a world of entanglement, and and try to try to even make sense of how we live in this space is an ongoing life work. And I'm not saying I'm doing like the ultimate great work uh, at the moment of, you know, marrying this worldview with everyday lives. Uh, there are people who li probably live like my indigenous friend and other friends who are even living in a more uh, caring rela relationship with earth. But I think the fact that to recognize this and see ourselves in the space of how do we contribute our care um, to the world is even something that we can just start with embracing it because that's how the life should be. Like we, there's almost no turning back, no alternative options we have. So I'm not saying I'm doing it great, but um, being able to recognize this and then trying our best based on everyone's conditionality because everyone has different conditions, right? People are earning different um, salaries. They are maybe have different upbringing that will put them in different situations. So it's not, I'm not saying everyone should be, you know, doing the same thing, but do what everyone can from their perspective to be able to live within this worldview is maybe something we all can start with. The example you gave, and it's not to nitpick, but uh, just I'm, I'm curious how you see this, because that entanglement in our society, all those systems moving through each other and interacting with each other, um, one might argue, you know, the fact that your fruit is has a plastic package saves us i don't know how many carbon emissions because uh it stays fresh longer so i'm standing there in the supermarket deciding on whether or not i should buy those bananas or whatever um, and i may be picking quote unquote the wrong option like it's and the reason i'm using this example is that it's again it can be so overwhelming and paralyzing because it's impossible to understand fully and deeply understand how all those systems are interacting together how do we move forward without uh, uh getting a panic attack in the supermarket um i think they are they are like the general rules uh people can can follow like buy loose vegetables uh which which is what i'm trying to do and if we if we like really understand how those plastic um, packages come into being, 
then it's a very scary uh, process. It's basically from oil drilling, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so if we understand that, I think the decisions are, are quite, uh, quite clear for individuals uh, to be more aware of like what is actually going on. Um, I'm, I'm not saying like, oh, you cannot use plastic anymore. Um, I'm just saying like, that is the fact and that's what's going on. So if you have that information, how do we make decisions to be in a better relationship? Um, I think that's important. Also focusing on the bigger picture of societal reimagination, I think it's also a very key, um, yeah, key area of focus. Like I mentioned about how we can look at how we organize um, our society and env environment um, in a space where we don't look at everything as commodities um, and look at governing. Like there are a lot of um, works around financing for commons um, and like governing for commons, that type of work would be like is a very interesting uh, design space to look into as well. Let's imagine that you get the opportunity to start an education system from scratch. What is a skill or a competence that you would definitely include in your educational system that is maybe lacking today in order to facilitate this radical imagination and these new worldviews? Yeah, I think um, in the current education system, um, it would be really good to be able to allow um, allow people to be able to observe um, the things they take for granted in a way that they can rethink about those. Um, I heard from my friend, um, like um, a baby, three years old, baby, before three years old, or three months, sorry, I forgot the exact number, but there was a period where you will be able con to construct your um, cognition in a way that you would absorb the, um, everything and then you wouldn't have like pre-assumptions of how things work and then so then everything you learn will be building on top of the foundation that you're already familiar with so there was a per period of time where humans are able to reconstruct um, their understanding of the world and being able to absorb them and make sense of them in a way that you don't have pre-assumptions um being able to train that that muscle memory and the brain to be able to do that i think it's quite it's quite key so how do we allow us to and as i mentioned earlier the people who are doing unlearning and relearning they are contributing a lot to building the, the muscle memory um, that allow us to challenge certain things. Actually, my colleagues are also teaching in, in universities um, and we are also sharing those provocations as well um, in the current architecture and design educa um, education system to allow um, students to be able to reflect on those provocations um, we provided and allow them to critically think about the design of those underlying structures and how how do we do them? How do we design them in a way that um, recognize the all being thriving again? Asking, asking these questions and uh, bringing these provocations forward is already a great step. And uh, for us uh, as old people, I consider my self these days to be an older people <laughs> in, the, in the bucket of old people, uh, especially if you ask my kids. Um, and there is definitely, we, there is so much we take for granted because that's just how the system works, the way we've been brought up. Um, 
and there's probably just as much unlearning to do, like you said. There aren't, um, we don't get exposed to alternative stories, as you said. Um, the narrative in the media is a very specific one. So it's hard to break out of those systems, right? If there is no, if, if there is, if, if it seems that there is no viable alternative. Are there no viable alternatives? Well, that's, um, I'm sure there are, but like you said, we don't see those stories all that much. Or at least, I think... uh, or at least I'm not seeking them out actively and therefore I'm not being exposed to them. Mm. And also we, we, we can create those stories. Mm -hmm. And, as, that's, um, and that's as, the and as, that's the work you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> let me um, let me ask you this. So, I'm sure we could have continued for uh, a long time here on the show, but we're sort of getting towards the end. And I'm always curious. You are not done. There is still a lot of work ahead of you. Is there a way people could help? tag on, uh, contribute, like, what could we do? Yeah, I want to put, I want to put out an invitation here for everyone who, yeah, who is listening to this conversation. Um, we are currently um, moving to a space where, like, people come into us and then say, these are, like, I understand the worldview, the the worldview shift needed in order to allow us to see the world and being with the world in a more reciprocal way. But what can we do in order to actually make it happen? And within our practice, we're exploring different methods uh, to make this work a reality that we can actually experience and feel and um, interact. So. Well, there's a terminology called proof of possibilities. So it's a uh, it's a riff from proof of concepts and other terminologies. The reason why we use possibilities is because we want to um, build like those proofs that allow us to get a flavor and to iterate the future um, possible futures that we would like to live in and how can we do it in a way that is iterative? So we are not building the thing, but we're building the possibilities and then we can test it and see if it's future proof. Um, so it requires like uh, a lot of designing, prototyping, testing to test how these ideas actually can land in a real context. We also build another, another term I'm going to introduce is system demonstrators. So think of it as a demonstration of the, the thing mm -hmm. <laughs> or the things we want to be interacting with um, in the society and the environment. So how do we demonstrate that in a way that can can prove that it can uh, allow uh, systems change? Uh, to happen. So it's not d designing the thing to change like one part of the system, but to do the demonstration that can unlock many different things that can allow the system to change. So these are the methodologies. And the invitation I have is please um, support us um, if you have a spe specific context specific community that you're interacting with, that you would like to test some of the provocations, some of the ideas that we're building. So those the, the ideas we're building are um, a self-owning house, it's a free house. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier about the contract we're designing. So it's part of the it's part of the, the free house. So we have like if if I put it really short, we have free house free river and free land and free many things you can add to it. And the free means freedom and also almost free. Okay. So the freedom as in, we're living in the space of, um, we need to talk about freedom to care, 
rather than freedom to escape. So when I say freedom to escape, it means like I need to build up so much of my wealth in order for me to escape from like a, a poor environment and to be to living a better situation. So that is freedom to escape, which is a lot of the wealth building um, mostly uh, is about. So how can we build the freedom to be able to care for uh, all being thriving? So the free means freedom for the house and freedom for every all beings. So how can we design the financial and governance systems to allow the house to be in a commoning receive her relationship with us instead of we extracting the environment in order for us to have security, the freedom to escape. So we're designing those elements and it, re it, it involves like currency design, for example. How do we design the value flows that wouldn't exacerbate the extractive economy by financing for the actual re regenerative futures? So we're designing currency and we need to deploy and test those currencies that allow uh, allow us to see the value flows in a very different dimensions. So we, we are talking about capturing value flows from the perspective of social flows, um, cultural flows, financial flows, economical flows. And we can apply this to the river, to the house, to the land. So there are a lot of design space, which we're working on a lot of provocations and proof of possibilities yeah, around contract design, uh, currency design. So when I say currency, it's current C. So it, currency is a mechanism for you to see the current of values rather than to extract from the, the, the material world. So stewardship design, uh, stewardship agreement, uh, which is part of the contract design, currency design, and um, yeah, interface design to be able to elicit care from humans. So these are all the design space and we're looking at um, context. So if you are working with a community or you are living in um, a, a city where you have really good connection with key stakeholders to design, making the flows of values visible, to be able to think about how do we then design the governance and fin finance flows of a self-owning house. So the house is not owned by, by anyone, but we are in a caring relationship with. How do we actually build those things and have those things in our city or communities? We are welcome anyone who wants to see this happen to talk to us and we can we can work together to make them a reality so we are looking for like community society organizations um, who can do this work with a real context with place-based approach we're looking um, for foundations who are happy and wanting to see the economy shift. We're already working with a uh, foundation, um, like for example, partners for a new economy. They are very interested in like how we can demonstrate those different instruments that allow us to build a new economy that is not based on extraction, um, alternatives way. So we are already working with uh, partners and founders are like happy to build this muscle and um, build the pathways for radical imagination and new reality. But we're, but in order to land it, we, we need more uh, partners and sites to be able to test those ideas. So that's my invitation, our invitation to put out here to looking for found, uh, foundations, founders, and partners who want to build this reality, uh, different realities with us. What is the best place to dig, dig deeper into this or to reach out to read more about uh, the work that you're doing and the partners that you're seeking? Yeah, so the best place um, is uh, to, there, there are various um, channels. We have a Radical Civics pro, uh, website and um, through, through that website, you can get in touch with us. So it's Radical, 
radicalcivics.cc. And the radical is is not R is R A D I C L E. Uh, and it's it means the embryo uh, shoot of a of a baby seed. And so if if you wanna like reimagining how we organize, you need to start from the the mm. the roots of of things. So it's radicalcivics.cc. I will uh, definitely add the link in the show notes, including many more. Uh, and many more like Dark Matter Labs website, uh, our Twitter, our LinkedIn. Yes, we'll have all of them in the show notes. Uh, Ray, one final question before we leave, and that is, what do you hope, what is the one thing you hope somebody will remember after listening to our conversation today? Um, I hope people will start to think about um, how they want to be with the world in any way they would approach it. And I'm just providing, or we're just providing uh, a few ways of being re in relationship with the world. But we believe there, there will be many more from different perspectives and different angles. So it's also an invitation for, for people to take and reflect whatever you heard um, and then see how it could be useful to apply in your own context. The thing that I'm taking away is we are already in a relationship with the world. So we can reflect on if that's the relationship we currently want to have and move forward with or if there is something that we want to change because the relationship is already there, but it might not be the most healthy one or we might not have made very deliberate and conscious choices about that exactly thank you uh for this conversation and inspiration and uh, i'm amazed by the work that you do i'm happy that there is a community and a place where this type of work can happen and thank you for coming on the show and sharing this with us today thank you for having me let's wrap up with a few thoughts this conversation definitely has me questioning my own assumptions and seeing beyond the obvious. What if some of the truth we rely on are totally wrong? Imagine the incredible solutions we could design if we thought differently. Like seeing ourselves as borrowers from the planet, not owners. We're better off for challenging those all beliefs. Now I'm curious, what systems or beliefs do you think need a complete overhaul? Share your thoughts in the comments below and let's keep this conversation going. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but rather to let me know whether we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you're going to impact, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Serbs Design Show. Take care and see you soon.